My name is Milenko Petrovic. I'm a senior lecturer above the bar and Jean Monnet chair here at the National Center for Research on Europe at the University of Canterbury, as I said, in New Zealand. And uh, the other presenters are, as I already mentioned, Prof. Maja Kovacic from the University of Belgrade, Shivan Wang, who is also here at the National Center of Research on Europe, and he is a PhD student. And the fourth presenter is the Associate uh, Fellow of the Garth Wilson Show, please, Garth, again. <laughs> Shivan. <laughs> Guard, come closer a bit. We, we are COVID free, as I said. So don't worry <laughs> about that. And uh, so our panel is about the EU and the Western Balkans in the 2020s. So second part of the title is uh, the question, more integration or divergent paths? So we will be discussing uh, the current state of play regarding the EU accession of the accession to the EU of the Western Balkan countries and actually their relationship with the EU and what are the prospects for the near future actually, what we expect going to happen in the 2020s. I will start with presenting or giving some general overview of EU relationship with the Western Balkans and uh, prospects in that respect. Uh, while uh, colleague Maya Kovacic, she will be looking at the more specifically on the European methodology, the new enlarged methodology adopted recently, I mean, in February this year, we have title of your presentation is the European Union's new enlargement methodology, reform or re reluctance. Shiven Wang will be speaking how to give some a bit optimistic view, speaking about China's impact on the EU relationship with the Western Balkan countries to the fact that China has increased its presence in the region, but still the general conclusion of her presentation, as you will hear, will be that uh, the EU is still the most important economic and political uh, partner for the countries in the Western Balkans. And then uh, Gart Wilson will conclude our panel speaking on the peculiarities of the impact of the problems in languages and alphabets uh, as a factor of threatening EU accession of the Western Balkan countries. So after this short introduction, I, I will start with my presentation. As I said, this is so, so short of uh, in the introductory one. And uh, then my colleagues will continue. So the title of my presentation is Two Decades of the Western Balkan Accession. Uh, EU accession process, uh, which mired between domestic political instabilities and the EU's tightened conditions. There will be three parts of which I will uh, use to present that what I want to say you today. So I will be starting with the slow progress, actually the beginning of the process, then the change of the EU's approach to the process in the mid 2000, and then we look at the current state of, of play with some encouraging signs, but the hesitant enlargement policy has continued. Okay, uh, so EU enlargement, what is say, if you can so say, of the Western Balkan countries started, or better say, hopes started in the mid, in the early 2000s, after the Serbia and Croatia started with, as I like to say, the second, the second democratization after removing the post-communist authoritarian leaders, Milosevic in Serbia and uh, Tudjman in Croatia. Almost uh, simultaneously, Tudjman died in December 1999 and 
Milošević was overthrown by the people of Serbia in October 2000. Then uh, the European Union launched uh, actually almost a few months earlier, in fact, the stabilization association process for these countries, uh, of the countries of Western Balkans, uh, as we know, all post Yugoslav states mi minus Slovenia plus plus Albania, which were included in that process, which uh, seek for the stabilization of these countries after basically all of them were affected by the wars in Croatia and Bosnia, or their involvement in this war, and, or at least uh, bearing consequences of that war. And uh, with prospects for, of course, uh, establishing close relationship with the EU and uh, hope for, for the future possible to follow the path of the countries who already were, were close to EU membership and joined the, uh, in uh, the EU in 2004. So the EU launched the process basically officially by adopting the famous Thessaloniki agenda at the summit in Thessaloniki in June 2003, when they stated that uh, <coughs> The Western Balkans can expect an ultimate membership into the Union, which is a high priority for the EU, and that the Balkans will be an integral part of a united Europe. However, after that, and enlargement enthusiasm, which was in those days also followed by or accompanied by the fact that so many countries already joined the Union in 2004, or former Communist Europe, so ex communist counterparts of the Western Balkan countries. But uh, progress, further progress started to go slowly from us, almost from the very beginning. Uh, and particularly, then basically was significantly slower by the changing of the EU's attitudes and actually tightening criteria in 2006 with the emergence of so called enlargement fatigue. Basically, before I say a few more words about enlargement fatigue and then tightening of criteria for accession, which the Western Balkan countries faced uh, dif differently than the countries who joined in 2004, they have one set of conditions adopted in uh, at the Copenhagen European Union meeting in 1993, while uh, the Western Balkan countries have several layers of condition which I will refer in just a minute or two. So, but basically, what are the explanations why they are so late in that, um, which I will actually, and actually all of the, this panel and basically more or less in some way, all uh, other uh, other three presentation will, will show that uh, the most important factor behind this uh, slowness actually is in the agent-driven political actions by on the both sides, but the prevailing responsibility in the respect is the role of actors, of the Balkan actors in the 1990s when they were not able to solve the internal differences within the former Yugoslavia and then finishing fighting the wars between each other. And of course, uh, in those conditions, under those circumstances, they could not have led any uh, real reforms or thorough process of reforms or making them uh, eligible to come closer to the EU, actually, to meet the necessary conditions for accession. However, the prevailing view by many academics and most EU politicians and officials is that uh, the slow progress in developing contractual relationship between the Western Balkan countries and actually ultimate membership has been caused primarily by the prolonged internal political instability and structural inabilities or incapacities of the Western Balkan states to adopt the EU's slash Western values and norms and in fact meet the necessary conditions, particularly those related, of course, to the establishing the functional institutional democracy and the functional market economy, which was the 
were the basic conditions for the countries who joined the EU uh, in 2004, as defined at the Copenhagen meeting of 1993. So, however, the, while the reasons are not that much structural, can be explained in many ways, I don't have time now to speak about that, but uh, generally, conditions in the Western Balkan countries were not that much different in during the communist times in particular, and even in the pre-communist times in the interwar period, all the, the countries in the region were basically functioned as a fun functional or relatively functional democracy in the first decade after the Second First World War, and after switch toward authoritarian or semi-authoritarian regimes, most of which were pro-Nazi, so very dictatorial or authoritarian wish. And the economic development was, of course, a bit better in the Central European countries, who joined in 2004, but not that much as uh, some structural claimed. And uh, in this uh, array of uh, political decisions which has been made after this enlargement enthusiasm, we will actually we will see how how strong actually how how big is the responsibility of the actors. And I would say more on the EU side and those on the on the Western Balkan domestic political players, although of course they cannot be excused, particularly some of them for not doing more to put their countries on the passive track toward the EU membership. However, <coughs> it is difficult to play, and this is actually the point of my presentation in this paper, when you have changed conditions. And uh, they have quite uh, frequently changed conditions, actually requirements which they had to meet to join the EU. And as I said, several layers of conditions they have to meet. So, fearing of uh, ability of EU or capacity of the EU institutions to absorb the accession of so many new, basically poor and politically unstable countries after they had the mega enlargement of 2004-2007, the EU decided to tighten the conditions for accession and the Western Balkan candidates or potential candidates in those days, instead of Copenhagen conditions or in addition to the basic Copenhagen conditions which were given to the countries who joined in 2004 and 2007, they have to, to meet Copenhagen plus conditions which were already given to them within the stabilization association process as a necessary factor or just because they had to clean the mess uh, which they made in the 1990s. These conditions were related to the improving uh, their uh, internal relations, actually inter-regional relations, reconciliation after the wars, refuge of, of uh, return of refugees who left their, their homes during the war, wars of the 1990s. Uh, delivery of the, those accused for the war crimes to the International Court in Heck, and so on. So these are this second set of second layer of conditions which I call Copenhagen Plus, which were required and necessary to be imposed on the Western Balkan countries. However, the third layer, which was included in this set established in 2006, which included First, broadening of the expanding the number of acquis to 35, but even more so tightening actually the requirements within each act, uh, each of the acquis uh, to the candidates. So they needed to do much more to close particular chapters than they, the countries who joined the EU in 2004-2007 were required to do. And on top of this, that came the fourth layer of conditions, Copenhagen plus, plus, plus conditions for these countries, which were related to the solution of the long-lasting statehood disputes, which were, again, original for the Western Balkans, and 
probably necessary to be done. But the way how do you deal with that, often without uh, the general plan and uh, some comprehensive action and the set of the strictly defined universal condition and requirements for solution of these questions made a problem for these countries to meet. So the approach was, for example, centralization. Uh, they have diff different approaches and sometimes in a couple of proposals were given to those countries for the solution of these issues. And uh, for example, centralization in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which anyone who knows something about Bosnia and Herzegovina could have expected is difficult to be achieved uh, considering uh, the internal situation and opposition to any centralization given by the Bosnian Serbs and mostly Bosnian Croats as well. On the other hand, the centralization, the solution of Macedonia and Serbia Montenegro, which again have had many opponents in the grounds in those countries, to this, and finally, the conflict which is still lasting. And I mean, all of these conflicts are still lasting to some extent, but particularly difficult is that one related to Serbia and Kosovo, actually, secession of Kosovo. Or from Serbia, after the declaration of Kosovo's independence in 2008, which was immediately opposed by Serbia, but Serbia find relatively powerful allies who then opposed that in the United Nations. And even uh, five countries, as we all know, five EU member states are not also accepting the Kosovo independence of Nico, is not recognized. So this reminder, there's an open question and, and not solved, and that four layer of conditions still remind and actually you know, occasionally become even most difficult one to be completed by the Balkan, Western Balkan country. These basic Copenhagen conditions of Titan in 2006, they were further tightened by the adoption of so-called three-pillar approach in 2012. And uh, Maybe uh, colleague Kovacevic will say something more about that. But uh, basically, that was, as I said, more again another burden to some extent. Despite the fact that the idea was to assist the countries to to better deal with the demands for the functioning rule of state, for fight for fight against corruption and so on. But in many respects, that was, as I said, additional and uh, more burden than assistance of these countries to overcome these challenges, the internal challenges. So all of them have no further progress in democratization, which was another problem, again, mostly domestically caused, but this lack of uh, enough assistance from the EU side can also be seen as a contributing factor. However, this is also often exaggerated. They problems with democratization or, or decline of democracy in these countries uh, by the EU side or some those who, who support that idea that actually the basic reason why these countries are late in post-communist transition and of succession to the EU is basically on their own instability and to their inabilities to actually democratize themselves and to meet these necessary criteria. However, uh, democratization, uh, the, the degrading of democratization and democracy level not, was not the Western Balkan phenomena. That uh, actually was the world phenomena. After 2008, there are many academic uh, sources, I mean, uh, journal articles, books written about that. And the, this table, and look at this table, which are indicators of democratization according to the Freedom House. You can see that Hungary and Poland also have problems, I mean, decline of democracy. The first two post communist countries were seen as a role model of democratization during the 1990s, early 2000. Uh, in 2017, Hungary came to 3.54, almost equalizing itself with Serbia, which was 3.82 and uh, so on. I mean, you can check this data in the, in the Freedom House National Transit 
publication. That was, of course, the problem, but as I said, I most see the problem primarily in the basically lack of interest on the EU side to assist uh, more con concretely and more uh, substantially those countries to overcome this the internal problems which are caused basically by the enlargement fatigue which was established in 2006-2007 and still is actual in those countries in the most EU member states so and to conclude with the current situation there were some encouraging signs actually basically after this uh, uh, additional tightening of conditions through the adoption of the tripular approach basically we don't have any significant progress in accession although serbia and montenegro as the two front runners have opened some cha chapters actually serbia opened uh, the process of accession in 2014 but uh, still the other countries were stuck and then when open accession negotiations Serbia also did not progress extremely well and quickly so they were encouraging signs with the launch of the 2018 enlargement strategy which uh, aimed to strengthen uh, a credibility of enlargement and its perspective to the western Balkan states and raise hopes that montenegro and serbia may be able to join as they as said regional front run only by 2025 there were also some encouraging signs with the success or relative success of the eu initiated and supervised belt of christian dialogue which seemed to be very close to the mutual acceptable solution in august 2018 and then finally by when greece lifted its veto on the opening accession negotiation with North Macedonia after the two countries finally found the deal by signing the so-called PRESPA agreement in June 2018 regarding the uh, North Macedonia's name, which was opposed by this earlier, earlier variant of the name was opposed. However, additional accession requirements were included even in this, if I can so say, encouraging signs which were given by the adoption of the UN Alignment Strategy. 18 because the strategy specifically said which was not said earlier in any documents on on ask to any of previous candidate countries to to be done to that the countries are obliged to find the definitive and binding solutions for their internal problems or disputes which uh, this solution must be found and implemented before a country access the unit was specifically stated in the document the new enlargement methodology which again was uh, accepted and the colleague Kovacic will particularly in that I speak about that which was adopted in February 2020 also in order to somehow speed up and encourage the process actually included also new demands and uncertainties about the final outcomes of the negotiation process all, all, all in all, there are pretty gloomy prospects for the Western Balkan accessions in 2020, which are further aggravated by the EU's continuous preoccupation with, it, with its internal issues. Now, foremost, the outbreak and the consequences of the COVID, I mean, particular economic consequences, was going to happen in the coming years after so much of the economy were devastated by the closures and problems related to the COVID pandemic. And these are, of course, related to the future of its internal cohesiveness, which were questioned by Brexit and some other issues and developments within the all member states, if you can so say. Of course, again, combined with the lack of genuine interest in effect to effectively assist the Western Balkan states to over, overcome their internal problems. Most important is Serbia Kosovo dispute, which is still open, because that Mogherini's attempts to close the deal in 2000 in August 2018 failed. Uh, and then after there were basically no any talks between the two parties. 
particularly not about the final resolution of the problem. Political statement in Bosnia and Herzegovina has not been removed, but now also appeared, despite the fact that after the adoption of this new methodology, the Council, which was easily prevented by Macron and those who didn't like to see that, finally gave the green light that Macedonia and Albania can open accession negotiations. Now, this is again threatened by possible Bulgaria veto on North Macedonia succession because they have that dispute over the latest history and ethnic identity, which is again expected that EU somehow moderate and assist in these countries to overcome, but he said not much interest on the EU side for that, at least not so far. So I'm concluding with that. We will probably come to some general conclusions at the end of the of the panel. And now I'm giving the floor to my colleague Maya. Uh, well, first I would like to thank you for being able to participate uh, uh, to this conference. Uh, I'm really glad to participate in in this debate, which is very interesting uh, for me. And also, I would like to thank our organizers for probably very very strong efforts that they uh, had put in uh, organizing this this so big conference in such difficult conditions. Uh, of course, Milenko, I can say that I agree with uh, your conclusions. And then I will just, uh, you know, uh, go a little bit more in technical uh, details now. And uh, what I would like to explain or to discuss with you is that, uh, as you already mentioned, uh, since uh, 2004, the European Commission has produced four enlargement methodology upgrades. So we are witnessing the constant change of the negotiation policy. And I will talk briefly about some gradual changes introduced uh, in this period, 2005-2015. But I will focus specifically about key changes which uh, uh, were introduced but by this new methodology from February 2020. In my opinion, it will, problem is not about methodology, and I will try to prove that in uh, using my arguments today. Uh, and uh, that's why I agree with uh, Milenko, it, it's mostly enlargement fatigue and the fact that uh, the EU is not strongly engaged in the region. Uh, of course, what is also important is this question, how credible is enlargement perspective today? And I think it is quite weak and really contradictory, ambivalent, let's say. Uh, and at the same time, I would like to stress the fact, and I will try to prove that today, that uh, European Union and its member states have very strong instruments uh, that they could use, could use in order to uh, bring more changes or, you know, uh, strengthen the reform process in the region, but they are not uh, uh, interested enough. Um, coming back to uh, that uh, enlargement strategy of the European Commission from 2018, uh, as you said, Milenko, it really gave rise to some hope for maybe Montenegro, Serbia. But let me remind you, just to st stress again this point, that uh, European Union uh, has not, uh, doesn't have, sorry, doesn't have a strategic approach. Because just 10 days after that strategy was released by European Commission, uh, the EU foreign ministers met in uh, uh, Sofia, in Bulgaria, for informal meeting, and they expressed reservations regarding the strategy uh, of the Commission. Uh, and here are some 
messages that they sent, you know, from Hungary, who, who said, well, Montenegro and Serbia should join already in uh, 2020. Slovenia said, no, 25 is not uh, realistic. Germany was very reluctant. France pointed out, again, importance of conditionality uh, and the rule of law issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we had some, some other opinions of uh, member states. Uh, but coming back to uh, uh, the, the last changes or mm, coming to last changes, uh, you all know that um, in October 2019, uh, at the meeting of European Council, we had this famous French veto over opening negotiations with yeah. uh, North Macedonia and Albania. And at that time, France was pushing and insisting that European Commission produce a new methodology. So basically, we are talking about French strategy. Uh, what uh, Macron said at that time, opening a purely bureaucratic process is absurd. We need to reform our membership procedures. They are no longer fit for purpose. They are not strategic. They are not political. They are not re reversible. I think it is not true, and I will try to uh, show you that uh, the process was always reversible, and uh, as I say, as, as I said, member states can really uh, change the the situation on the ground. Al already in two thousand five, uh, one important step was introduced because it said that in case of serious and persistent breach by negotiation country of the principles of liberty democracy respect for for human rights rule of law etc etc accession negotiations may be suspended so we have this since 2005 another thing uh, yeah, this is, sorry, this is famous. It was adopted before Croatia and Turkey open accession negotiations. Yes, yes precisely. 2005, that was the difference. One of these tightening conditions, which I spoke in my presentation. Exactly, exactly. And now they are tightening again. Yes, <laughs> even <laughs> more. <that> <laughs> you know? So it, then also in 2005, they, they introduced this uh, screening process. They introduced also this benchmarking process. I'm not going to go into details because I assume you, you all know what it is. And also closing benchmarks, which means for every chapter, they introduced basically three steps, you know, for opening uh, the chapter, for following what is happening within uh, this process, and then for uh, closing. Let us go further. In 2012 or 2011, but just before Montenegro started negotiations, European Union said, okay, new approach will be to open uh, chapters related to judiciary and fundamental rights and justice and home affairs. So everything about the democracy, judiciary, fight uh, against organized crime, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Those chapters will be open, opened first, and uh, they will not be provisionally closed till the end of uh, the negotiations. Which means that we are pressing you all the times on those uh, really very important issues. And also, uh, European Union introduced uh, uh, kind of uh, more insisting on political uh, criteria uh, in the sense uh, that, uh, uh, as I said, two chapters would not be provisionally closed until the end of negotiations. And in 2015, finally, the EU redesigned 
these regular reports introducing so-called clear language, introducing indications that should be comparable between different candidates. And the idea was that uh, European Commission will publish kind of comparable uh, reports, which should boost kind of, you know, competition between candidates. And also, uh, there was stronger insistence on improving economic governance. So European Union was thinking, uh, we will try to work with candidates in a sense that one day that they will be ready for joining, you know, uh, methodology of European semester, at, uh, etc. Okay, and now before talking uh, more about new methodology, I just wanted to stress this. Uh, look how numerous are veto points in the uh, negotiation process. So first, for a country to gain status of a candidate, that country needs unanimous decision by the Council uh, and also endorsement by the European Council. Accession negotiations cannot be opened again without unanimous decision of member states. Also, member states uh, take unanimous decisions on opening uh, every chapter, every one of uh, 35, uh, which are now uh, negotiating chapters. That means that for every chapter, the Council adopts common position and it may set opening, interim or closing benchmarks for uh, each chapter. Usually, there are no closing, uh, there are no closing chapters. Usually all chapters remain open till the end. This is in practice. Only, you know, you close kind of uh, research education, uh, kind of this easy and not really problematic uh, chapters. As I said, no negotiation on any individual chapter are closed until every EU government is satisfied. And also, uh, there is this saying, you know, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed, which means until the accession treaty is signed, everything could be opened and, uh, you know, um, challenged uh, again. Uh, so, uh, as you know, the negotiations are concluded once the EU and the candidate countries have reached agreement on all 35 uh, chapters. And after that, it needed to be confirmed by uh, the European Council. And again, after that, there is a need for accession treaty to be supported by EU Council, European Parliament uh, Commission, to be signed by uh, candidate countries and all existing EU countries and, of course, ratified. So these are numerous uh, veto points and it is really difficult to say uh, that, you know, this process is not reversible. This process can be stopped at every moment, even before this new methodology. But let us see also a little bit closer into uh, general EU position, which are basically negotiating uh, framework for Montenegro and Serbia, because these two countries are now from Western Balkans are negotiating a membership. And what is said by their very, very nature, the negotiation uh, ne negotiations are an open ended process whose outcome cannot be guaranteed. That was the same with the Croatia. So it is you know, long-standing approach of the EU. So it is not really clear why one would conclude that the process is not reversible. Uh, furthermore, uh, sorry, I try to go to next. Uh, there is this clause. In, in case of a serious and persistent break by Montenegro or Serbia, of the values on which the Union is founded, 
the Commission will, on its own in initiative or on the request of one third of member states, recommend the suspension of negotiations and propose the conditions for eventual resumption. The Council will decide by qualified majority. That means that already in the negotiating process, European Union can stop further negotiations and ask for some uh, conditions to be uh, fulfilled. Furthermore, on top of that, there is a so-called balance clause which was introduced with the Montenegro and Serbia. Basically, what it is all about, it says that, for example, if let us take the case of Serbia, maybe we can have spectacular results in economic uh, chapters or financial or competition chapters, etc. But if we are lagging behind in the field of uh, democracy, rule of law, judiciary, uh, human rights, etc., that means again that the whole negotiations could be stopped and in order to address this imbalance between democratization and other uh, negotiation chapters. And on top of that, for Serbia, there is this Kosovo condition. Uh, Kosovo is in the case of Serbia part of chapter 35. And at any moment, European Union can stop all negotiations, uh, accession negotiations with Serbia, if European Union finds that Serbia is failing to act in good faith uh, in uh, this process of uh, looking for some solution with Kosovo. So you can... Sorry, Maya, we are running over. Can you go now to the methodology to see? Yes. Okay, it's pretty clear. So yes. that was before the methodology. So what we got with the new methodology? Yes, I'm going, but this is just... Just a second. It's here. Yeah. It's too big. Okay. Okay. What are novelties? One uh, novelty is political one, in the sense that new methodology uh, should offer high-level political dialogue with the countries through regular EU Western Balkan summits. Mo probably that would be organized on a yearly basis. So far, we had only four EU Western Balkan summits. So this kind of high level political dialogue would be really a good thing. Uh, what is said further, <laughs> that this increased engagement could lead uh, to the countries, candidate countries, participating as observers in key European Union uh, meetings on matters of substantial importance to them. But look, this is status of observer, so you cannot take part, of course, in the decision making. And third, the novelty, also political, is that every year there would uh, there should be uh, specific intergovernmental conferences uh, uh, with every state and where European Union and that state could discuss all important issues uh, which are on the table. But the problem with this methodology is that it, it goes, you know, I put this title on the slow train to clusters. I use the title of uh, John O'Brannan, you know, yeah. the slow train to nowhere. And now we are going to clusters. Why? The negotiation chapters will be organized in thematic clusters and negotiations on each cluster will be open as a whole after fulfilling the opening benchmarks. So what does it mean? It means probably, we don't know yet, but probably European Union will say, okay, you prepare for uh, chapters and I will show you just uh, for information how it is looked like. So you prepare all of that and then we will open negotiation on negotiations on 
uh, that chapter. So in my opinion, it will not speed up the process. On the contrary, although in this new methodology, the methodology say, uh, the, says the time frame between opening a, a cluster and closing the individual chapters should be limited, preferably, but we don't know, within a year. That means you go, you prepare for five, six, ten years for your chapter, and then we will open it and we will close it very, very fast. We don't know, but still chapters will be closed uh, individually. Uh, very ambivalent are rewards which are offered. And here again, I joked with the Horizon 2020, and uh, let me explain you why. Uh, European Union says, if countries move on reform priorities agreed in the negotiations sufficiently, this should lead to closer integration of the country with the EU, which is a very vague uh, phrase, you know. Uh, phasing into individual EU policies. Again, it is very vague. Uh, phasing in into in the EU market and EU programs, and that's why I joked, because, for example, as you know, Horizon 2020 is a huge research program, of the European Union, but Serbia, for example, and other countries are, are already participating in that program. And even we pay money for the budget of the horizon also to do, to use uh, the example of Serbia. Serbia has working uh, agreements with, for example, Europol, with Frontex, uh, with the European Defense Agency, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, we are closely already cooperating with uh, some uh, EU bodies, you know. That's why I really don't see what uh, is new here. And other um, ambivalent uh, reward, increased funding and investments, including through a performance-based instrument from, for pre-accession, and closer cooperation with international financial institutions. But that is already, you know, at the disposal uh, of the EU. So the, there is nothing new. Uh, now, the case of Serbia and Montenegro, and quite strange case, because Serbia and Montenegro, as you know, started negotiations earlier. But no, we are running out of time. I have to give the floor to the other speakers. Can you finish? Okay, okay. In a few sentences. And Montenegro accepted uh, the framework, and we can talk uh, about that later. Uh, there is really one catch with the new uh, system for sanctions, but we can talk about that in uh, discussions. But basically, my short conclusion would be that uh, new methodology is just opening the door for differentiated integration in the future, and basically is buying time to for the EU to rethink its uh, its future and maybe relegate enlargement for distant uh, future. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just one question before I leave you. <laughs> to, uh, so why Serbia and Montenegro accepted new met methodology as they were offered not to accept? What was the carrot offered to them? And the other one is how this like, uh, I mean, Montenegro opened all of the chapters and what's going now to happen with these clusters? How uh, they are going to I, I think that uh, in case of Montenegro, they accepted uh, the uh, new methodology. First, for both countries, I mentioned uh, numerous veto points. Both countries are aware that European Union or France or any other country can veto the process and put them de facto on the same pace as uh, other countries. This is one thing. For Montenegro, for example, uh, Montenegro accepted new methodology in May, and in June they opened the last chapter. There we could think about some, you know, quit. Yeah. Yes. 
And also, uh, elections were coming in uh, Montenegro, as you know, they were held at the end of August. And we should not forget that European Union is really a complice of our, you know, governments here. And, uh, you know, probably Montenegro would expect that European Union would not criticize much. In case of Serbia, it is more, I would say, one man show. Because Vucic accepted this methodology at his meeting with Macron in Paris. And he said, he declared to, to the press, that will mean that when Serbia opens economic and social chapters, it immediately starts to have access to funds and everything else from those chapters, which is not true. And he added, <laughs> I think the French hosts were satisfied. Okay. Okay, thank you. Now, another perspective for actually why still uh, the EU needs those countries and those countries needs the EU. We will see from Shivan's presentation on the importance of Chinese, actually impacts on Chinese interference on the EU's relations with these goods. Assisting countries, we can see on the map here, include uh, which includes the three Baltic states, the V4 countries, the Balkan countries, and uh, there are 11 EU member states, and the others are not. Well, the BRI is a quite philosophical and grand foreign policy, but the 16 plus one is much more specific uh, in terms of uh, which area that China wants to cooperate with the citizen countries? Well, uh, on the, in the initial document that they released by the Chinese government, Chinese government proposed to hold an annual meeting between Chinese and targeted countries representatives, most importantly, the 16 plus one annual summits of heads of states between China and the citizen countries, and it has been held since 2012. And also, Chinese government set up has already set up a secretariat for bilateral corporate affairs, which is based uh, at the Ministry of, Ch of, of China's uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in China. And also, China aims to offer 10 billion uh, credit credit dollars to the citizen countries for investment cooperation on, invest on infrastructure, industry, high and new technologies, and growth economy. And also, China also has established a variety of investment and research funds for cooperation on political, economic, and cultural affairs. And uh, in terms of cultural aspects, uh, Chinese government founded to they founded two um, think tank net networks. The first one is China CEC think, ne think tanks net network, and the other one is China CEC Institute, which were established as uh, bilingual institutionalized platforms to promote academic news on relevant activities with, with an incentive. And uh, also, Chinese government hold trade promotion fairs and investment forums between China and CZ countries since 2012. And uh, the government also aims to offer scholarships specifically for region to intensify academic exchanges. Um, and the government also proposed in 2012 to establish a tourism promotion alliance between China and the sea countries. So, um, with this uh, China's proposal of closing uh, of closer engagement with the Western Balkan states, um, actually the region is well positioned in China's BRI plan of entering Europe via the region. As we can see from this map here, um, this so-called Land Sea Express Route starts from Pyrus uh, in Greece and then goes through uh, North Macedonia and then. Uh, through Serbia and then reach Budapest. It's part of the BRI. And uh, 
Chinese engagement with the Western Balkans raised the uh, with the suspicion in the EU because China emerged as a new source of funding for the countries in the region with little or no strings attached when compared to more bureaucratic EU institutional and administrative grant processes. And Chinese infrastructure projects in the Balkans are filled in corruption. And their enga engagement with China may jeopardize their endeavor in accepting and following EU standards and rules in their social and economic reforms, which poses a potential risk towards their, e their European integration process. Well, uh, Chinese scholars have already evaluated the cooperation level between China and the, West and the Western Balkan states. As we can see from this table here, in, um, they evaluated uh, China's cooperation with these countries um, on political, economic, and culture, cultural aspects. Uh, we can see here that, that overall, the bilateral cooperation level between China and the West Balkan states enhanced from 2011 to 2016 after China has launched this um, cooperation framework. And Serbia was evaluated the most intimate partner of China in the region in 2016. And it reached 5.21 out of 10, which is the highest among all of the countries in the region. While Montenegro, uh, Montenegro has the least amount of uh, value in terms of cooperation with China. And also um, the score uh, that Albania, Croatia, and North, North, uh, North Macedonia uh, has also enhanced compared to 2011 in 2016. So therefore, by looking at China's relationship with these four countries, basically we can see uh, the extent that China's influence in the region. We'll start with the case of Croatia. Um, because the 16 plus 1 cooperation framework, as we just have seen, it's basically quite economic oriented. So we will see the trade statistic here and also their investment information. Uh, in terms of the case of Croatia, um, we can see that from 2012 to 2018 in this table, that nearly in 2018, nearly 17% of Croatian exports went to the EU. Uh, only less than 1% went to China after years of economic cooperation. And Croatia's imports of goods and services from China began to increase after 2015. And it's, as we can see here, it increased. China's increased from 7.1% to 2 0.6 in 2014. Uh, and, but, but Croatia managed to decrease trade deficit with China in 2018 compared with 2012. Well, China's closest ally in Western Balkans, in the case of Serbia, if we will look at the Serbia's Stop trade. Speaking. Nobody is hearing you apart from us. Tell the guy. Ask him, is the guy hearing us? I hear you. Uh, I hear you. Live stream. Well, but, but the other colleague can hear me. Yeah, yeah. The colleague who is in the room in this program with you, but no, but no one else. There's no live stream on YouTube. Okay. Can you ask him to check the support team? Someone is. is Hi. Hello. We are checking it on it now. We can see the live stream. Maybe it has a little bit of delay, but but it works. Uh, but we are checking on it. Okay. So can I continue? Because I cannot see. It. It's not working. I'm doing it, but... We, are live, uh, we, we watch the live now in the in another desktop and it works properly. Okay. Which, okay, I will continue. Yeah. 
Okay. So uh, in the case of Serbia, um, we can see here that the share of imports from China in the total Serbian imports only rose by like 1% from 2012 to 2018. And more than 60% of Serbian imports are from the EU. And Serbia's dependence on the EU market is particularly significant in terms of its exports. Over 70% of Serbian exports went to the EU in 2018, and it has increased by around uh, some 10% from that compared with the data in 2012. Well, as of its exports to China increased by only 0.3%. And another Chinese partner in the region, in the case of Albania, in terms of trade, uh, you can see that here it's the same, it's basically the same trend. The EU has constantly dominated with a share of over 60% of Albania's total trade from 2012 to 2018, whereas China's share of total Albanian trade was less was less than percent in the same period. Well, in the case of North Macedonia, we can see from the table here in 2018, the share of Macedonia imports from China was only uh, 0 0.1 percent higher than that in uh, 2012, and on the other hand, yeah, it's, against... it's go, already go. very low exports, um, very low at only 3.9% in 2012. Um, share exports to China has further decreased by some 3% and to 0.9% in 2018. However, same period, the share of North Macedonia's exports to the EU increased to above 80 percent. Don't worry, we have to hmm? even longer stay long, you don't worry. Okay, so um, no, no. therefore, according to the data that we have gathered, it is. Uh, it's clear that it is, yeah. the EU remains the biggest trade partner of the region and uh, dominating over 70% share of the region's total trade volume. However, the trade engagement of China was only improved slightly over the years, even though China has been really um, active in proposing all sorts of engagement, economic cooperation with the region. And uh, from 2012, and 19, the total amount of Chinese loans given to the West Balkans reached, reached around $40 billion. Serbia alone received more than 60%. Uh, because of time limitation, I won't give the specific uh, China's FDI investment in each country. Uh, but uh, according to the data that's released by the European Commission, Chinese FDI in the region, in the Western Balkan states, is quite marginal compared to the EU's. The statistics, uh, statistics suggest that the EU contributed for over 70% of the region's total FDI flow from 2017 to, uh, to 2015, while China's share was only 0.1%. And from 2013 to 2018, the EU companies invested over $11 billion to the region and is the biggest investor of the region. Therefore, uh, back to the question and also the title of this presentation. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, in terms of uh, the Western Balkan states' accession progress to the EU, while the Croatia is already a EU member state and Albania, Serbia, North, Mac North Macedonia, Montenegro are officially EU candidates, and then Bosnia and Kosovo are EU potential candidates. And um, all of them okay, have this is, but go to conclusions. This is uh, well known, okay. more or less. Okay, so yes. basically, we can conclude that Serbia is the only country in the Western Balkans to build a strategic partnership with China, 
while other countries' overall bilateral relations with China remain at either cooperative partnership level, for example, with, Alba with Albania and North Macedonia, or comprehensive corporate, uh, cooperative partnership, such as China-Croatia relations. And Chinese economic presence in the region is quite marginal, and it remains the most significant economic partner in the region and place the most important factor in influence in the region's social and economic landscape. And EU is a major source of technical and financial assistance for conducting a variety of social reforms in advancing democracy, the rule of law, regional cooperation, and economic marketization in the region. Okay. Thank you, Shiren. Um, now we can go. Gars. To God's I, presentation. Yeah. Okay. To see how. What are up to the Western Balkan states? I mean, which they can cannot have particular assistance from the EU, but still bother their relationship significantly. Okay. Okay. You can talk. Okay, you can talk, Your PowerPoint is here. They can see this slide. Yeah, they can see. Okay. Hello from New Zealand. Uh, Hello. Look at the camera. Camera. Look at the camera. Sit in front of the. Sit. Sit in the front. Just sit in the front of laptop. Okay. okay, that's fine now. So today I want to talk about an issue uh, that exists particularly among the countries of the former U Yugoslavia about language and the disputes that have arisen over language and alphabet. Uh, because the European Union has made it clear that accession will only take place if a country has normalized its relations with its neighbors. Now, linguistic diversity is the preeminent marker of the European Union, has been so since its very foundation. We'll start uh, by looking at a map of Croatia and circled is the city of Vukovar. Now, this is important because earlier this year, there was a presidential election in Croatia, and both candidates in the runoff uh, went to Vukovar to explain their attitude towards the city and the significance that the city has in Croatia's modern history. Vuk Vukovar people refer to their city as a city of heroes. In 1991, the city was bombed by paramilitary forces and almost totally destroyed. As a result of that Battle of Vukovar, it has become, as some have put it, the foundational myth of the Croatian state. And as Kruno Cardo said, it is as much an imagined place as it is a real place. Vukovar has turned into the central point of Croatian national identity. Now, one of the candidates in the runoff for the Croatian presidential election was Graba Kitarovic. She described Vukovar as a wound in Croatia's heart that will never heal. The other candidate, uh, Milanovic, he went to Vukovar and said, the war is over and we want uh, Croatia to be a modern and a normal European country. As early as 2013, the city council in Vukovar uh, 
took exception to the placement of bilingual signs in the city. Now, of course, the Croatian constitution uh, allows for municipalities which have a 30% minority uh, to have the language and script of that minority displayed in the city. And Vukovar is one of those cities where th more than 30% of the population is or declare themselves to be of Serbian ethnicity and they want the alphabet, the Cyrillic alphabet, uh, to be used on public signs in the city. But the city council in Vukovar, they declared the official language of Vukovar is Croatian, the official script is Latin. And so what happened when signs went up in the city, uh, both in the Latin alphabet and the Cyrillic alphabet, protesters removed the signs. And this was seen as a victory for the people that opposed another alphabet. There were marches. Please note the presence of mem members of the Catholic Church there. And there were protests around Croatia. Here's a group from Dubrovnik. It will always be Vukovar in the Latin alphabet, not in the Cyrillic alphabet. Individuals start to interfere with public road signs, removing, attempting to remove the Cyrillic alphabet. So in the form of Yugoslavia, identity is your, your slides come after you are talking about them. It can be done something about them. You first refer to the slides, then slides are fitting. Uh, internet has four, uh, identity has four pillars. And these pillars are almost inflexible. Nationality, ethnicity, language and religion. So it is that in the country, the former Yugoslavia in particular, nationality equals language. So the countries that emerged from Yugoslavia have their own identity and therefore they have their own language. Bosansky, Havatsky, Serbsky, Cernogorsky. Now, language has become a weapon. Instead of bringing people together, language separates people. People's identity has become uh, determined as much by the alphabet they use and by minor differences in pronunciation as by the religion they claim to profess or the ethnicity they have adopted as their own. In 2017, there was a call for a common language, remembering that these languages, for the most part, emerged from a language known as Serbo-Croatian or Croato-Serbian. This declaration, unveiled in Sarajevo, insisted that the people in Bosnia, Serbia, Croatia, Montenegro speak more or less than the, the same language. A declaration signed by 200 linguists, scientists, activists, writers, other academics. But no sooner was this drawn up, and remember the intention was to challenge uh, the use of language in the Western Balkans as a political tool to stoke nationalist tensions. As soon as this uh, conference came to this conclusion, it met opposition from politicians and from some academics. And one of the first to complain about it was the Croatian Prime Minister, Plenković. How could such a policy be agreed to. Who in Croatia, he said, can support it? For we, for us, the language of Croatian is set out in the constitution. The Croatian language is one of the official languages of the European Union. For me, he said, that's all that matters. Now, what 
language differentiation has taken place since the breakup of Yugoslavia. Okay, so some of the countries have created new vocabulary, especially for words commonly used. Some, particularly uh, Montenegro, have created new letters of the alphabet. Some in countries are emphasizing and exaggerating differences of pronunciation. There are near identical dictionaries being produced, but they're called dictionaries of a different language. So a dictionary of Bosansky, which can be purchased in Bosnia, is exactly the same as a dictionary of Serbia, but the Bosnians do not recognize the language as the same. Here's the example of an Englishko Bosanski, Bosansko Englishki Rechnik dictionary. It's exactly the same contents as a Serbian dictionary. We know, though, in real life, identity is fluid, that we as human beings make our own identity. Identity is something that constructs, it constructs itself during a person's lifetime. Our identity is not set in stone. Identity is not an absolute truth. Identity is an artificial creation, said Patrick Whittle, imposed from above by those with a vested interest in controlling it. Because cultural practices can and do evolve. Why? What is this vested interest in controlling our identity. As one political observer remarked, the spread of a new form of rule is taking place in the Western Balkans. Authoritarian leadership together with nationalist ideology. Zelimir Zelnik says, in ex-Yugoslavia today, there is doubt that the, there is no doubt that there will be ten cooperation because it's in the interest of new bureaucracies that these tensions remain because that remaining the tensions that remain allow the political bureaucracies to survive just a week ago pope francis in fratelli tutti said ancient conflicts thought long ago buried are breaking out anew, while instances of a myopic, extremist, resentful, and aggressive nationalism are on the rise. A President Milanovic, Asia refers to what Pope Francis calls aggressive nationalism, raw nationalism. Now, there need not only be a, uh, a totalitarian uh, administration in a country. Take, for example, the ideology of a greater Albania. We could not say by any stretch that Albania is any in any form a dictatorship. But this concept of a greater Albania does exist. And just recently, the Bulgarian government threatened to blockade North Macedonia's progress to membership of the EU over questions of identity, including whether Macedonian can claim to be a language at all, when according to the Borisov government, it was artificially codified during the Tito years as a separate language, and not just what it really is, according to the Borisov government, a dialect of Bulgarian. And yet, these posters have been appearing in Plovdiv recently. Zero tolerance to people who not only look differently, but speak differently. A few years ago, the ambassadors of Scandinavian countries held a press conference in the Serbian capital to explain to people how Scandinavian 
Scandinavian countries deal with issues they might have in dispute. And they emphasize these points, which I submit are the is the method, the, the path that countries in the, in the Western Balkans should follow. Firstly, that these Scandinavian countries do naturally have different views on certain issues. But first and foremost, they look upon one another as friends and partners who are jointly fighting upcoming challenges. Scandinavian countries share experiences and learn from one another. They acknowledge that a large part of their cultural heritage is shared, just, of course, a large part of the cultural heritage of the former Yugoslavia is shared. And they said, the ambassadors, that the EU accession process provides a unique opportunity opportunity for significant improvement for the economy and for the citizens of those countries. And that the this means there will be a huge homeland, such as the, the countries in the Western Balkans can form a huge homeland for citizens there to solve their problems before the European Union becomes a of them. As they said, history has taught us that we are stronger together. Thank you, Gart. Thank you all for uh, watching those who were, have been patient to watch us. I mean, after all these technical issues and problems we had, but hopefully it was interesting and uh, I hope that we give some, as I said, opinion to what's going on and what can be done. We have seen that uh, we, uh, a lot is on the countries, so it's particularly the last presentation of the Balkans to solve, but as uh, Maya and I argued earlier, they need help. They need a lot of assistance from the EU and that assistance is to be not that much generous. If I can so say in some simplification, if you have two children, one children is more advanced and doing well, then you are not only saying, okay, fine, that you are doing well, I love you, and the other child is not that good, and you say, okay, you are not able to join us on the board, go play yourself. I mean, try to improve yourself and come back. No, you, you're trying to assist that child which is not that good more than the one who is more advanced and who is able to, to learn and to to adopt your values and norms if I can simplify the things. Okay, thank you very much for being with us and all the best from thank New you. Zealand, from Belgrade and Greece. Thank you. Thank you.